Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, we want to express to you the thanksgiving that we have in our hearts for the wonderful, gracious, merciful Father that you are, for the way that you have loved us, blessed us, forgiven us, and given us such a wonderful Savior and Redeemer in your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you that he was willing to come to this earth and live the life that he lived, given us the example that he gave of how to live our lives, and then his willingness to go to that tree and be crucified so that we could be redeemed and become your children and forgiven of all of our sins. Father, thank you so much for that. We love you and we are so grateful to you. Father, as your church, as your church worships you today, we lift our voices in praise to you. We are honored by the opportunity to speak with you and thank you, praise you, and express to you some concerns and desires that we have in our hearts. Father, as we try to live our lives in honor of you, we just pray that you will help us to live as Christ lived, to love others, to share your word with others, and to do all that we can to lead others to you. Father, we thank you for the church and for what it means to each of our lives. We thank you for Stantonville and for what we mean to each other, for the love that we share, for the unity that we enjoy, and for the grace that you have given us. Father, we're in a time right now where uh, our country is in turmoil. And we feel part of that reason is because we have taken you out of our country and decided to do things on our own. And we've seen the result. And Father, we just pray that our country will look to you and look to your son, to your word, to the life of Jesus, to the direction your word gives us, and that we will decide again to follow that and put you first in all of our lives. Father, you have blessed us in so many ways. We are, again, thankful for the avenue of prayer, and we're thankful for answered prayer. We have seen several of our family who have been ill that have recovered. We know of some that have been uh, shown compassion and relieved of some of the uh, pain and agony they've had with grief in their family. And we thank you for that. We have seen some come to you and become a part of your family through the obedience of the gospel. And we are so grateful for that. Father, we pray that you will continue to bless us. We pray that our worship today is acceptable to you. And as we remember Jesus, and his sacrifice through partaking of the Lord's Supper. Father, may that strengthen us. May we gain even a greater appreciation for what has been done for us. We thank you for forgiveness. We thank you for your long suffering. And these things we pray through the name of your Son, Jesus. 
Amen. Each week as we come together, uh, whether that's virtually or in person, uh, we take time uh, to remember the sacrifice of Jesus uh, through the Lord's Supper. Um, and each week as, as we go about this, I know I personally um, have struggled from time to time to really focus um, on the things that I should be. And I have found personally that sometimes reflecting on songs that we sing uh, maybe give the Lord's Supper time um, a lot more meaning to me. Uh, So today, as we prepare to partake the Lord's Supper, I want to read you some lyrics from a song that that I often think about uh, while I partake personally. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, The Father turns His face away, as wounds which mar the Chosen One bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon His shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held Him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. This morning as we partake of the Lord's Supper, I want you to think 
Think about it was your sins, my sins, that held him on the cross until it was accomplished. And that his wounds have paid our ransom. Let's pray for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your sacrifice. Um, the sacrifice of your son. God, we realize that it was because of our sin that you have made a plan to redeem us. And we realize that it was because of our sin that Jesus went to the cross and that he suffered the great things that he did. God, we pray this morning that we can partake of this bread in a worthy manner, uh, examining the body of Christ as well as examining our own lives to see that we are living as much like Christ as possible. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. God, as we continue our prayer, we want to pray for the cup that represents your son's blood. Again, Father, we pray that we can realize that it was our sin that Christ was dying for and our sin that caused him to shed that blood. We pray that we can take this in a worthy manner while reflecting on the cross as well as ourselves. In Christ's name, amen. A couple of weeks back, Larry and Jane went on a little trip to South Carolina to visit family and to be there when their granddaughter had back surgery. In the process, they made me a steward of their chickens. They made me a chicken tender, okay? But it was my responsibility because they owned those chickens for me to do and take care of them as if they were my own. I was, had a responsibility to take care of them, so I was the steward, and the, we we have a, a reading today of the parable of the unjust steward. A steward is someone who takes care of something that belongs to someone else. Now, I don't know if they were Larry and Jane's chickens or just Larry's. I don't, I don't know if Jane claims them or not. But, but I had the responsibility every day of going and making sure they had the right, the, the right food and water and gathered the eggs and also watered the tomato plants. I didn't have to do it much because it rained almost every day, but, but we, we took care of those. So I was a steward. I was responsible for someone else's stuff. That's what we find here in the book of Luke, chapter 16. To give us a little bit of uh, background as to what's going on here, we go clear back to chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, and we find some other events that are happening there, and we see who's involved in this particular account. In Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, Jesus is eating with tax collectors and sinners. And as he's eating with them, we see the scribes and the Pharisees are there as well. Notice what it says. Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And Jesus went on from, from that context, knowing that there were sinners and tax collectors there, but also the Pharisees and the scribes, the leaders of the Jews, knowing that they were there. He told three parables in the rest of this chapter, and I believe that it continues on into the next chapter that we'll be looking at today. But here we find... Jesus telling these parables, there's the parable of the lost sheep where one out of a hundred was lost, the parable of the lost coin where one out of ten was lost, and then the parable of the prodigal son, and then of course the older brother involved as well, and speaking there of the Pharisees. So we see all of this going on, and Jesus is telling these parables, but we also know that Jesus' disciples are there as well. If you look at chapter 16 and verse 1, notice it says, He also said to his disciples, and the fact that it said also gives us an indication that they were there during the whole time, and he just continues the teaching. But the Pharisees and the scribes are still there because they know that Jesus is talking about them. Look at chapter 6, verse 14. 
Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things, and they derided him. So the Pharisees are there as well. So they're all still in the same context. And Jesus is telling these parables and giving indication that the Pharisees aren't who they're supposed to be. When Jesus is eating with the tax collectors and the sinners, he had an interest in their soul. The Pharisees didn't. In fact, the Pharisees saw sinners who needed to be avoided. Jesus saw people who needed to be saved. Now, there's a lesson in that in and of itself when we can see people around us. And sometimes we see people who are involved in sin and we just want to completely avoid them. But what they need is Jesus. And when we have opportunity and when we have a chance to say something or do something to help, uh, are we willing to do that? So we see this is the context where all this is taking place. And we call this the parable of the unjust steward. Um, a steward is someone, as we see it defined, a steward is someone, let me back up here, is, who's a trustee, one who has been given the management of property or money, etc. He's not the owner. So a steward is someone who is taking care of something that belongs to somebody else. And in, the, in a sense, all of us are stewards of everything that we have because we really don't own anything. Everything we have belongs to God. He's, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, including your hill and your cattle. So God, know, God owns everything, and he's loaned it to us for us to take care of in the short time that we're here. And when we leave, we can't take it with us. It's left behind for somebody else to take care of after we're gone. So Jesus here is talking about this, this steward, and he called, it, he called him an unjust steward. Well, if you've ever rented from somebody, if you've ever rented a house or rented an apartment, then you, you were in a stewardship position. You were there and you were in somebody else's property and you were taking care of that. If you've ever been a babysitter, you were a steward. You took care of somebody else's kids and you had the responsibility of watching those kids and making sure that they were safe and healthy and, and that was involved in that. Any time that you took care of something that belonged to somebody else, you were a steward or a manager, as he calls it here. This particular steward was uh, working for a very wealthy man. He was, uh, uh, he called him a rich man, and this steward was in charge of all of his properties, all of his assets, all of his stuff. This man was in charge of it. We could think back in the Old Testament to Joseph, how he was put in charge of all of Potiphar's house and that some, somewhat of the same situation. So he's a trustee, one who's been given management of the property or money of another person. So as we look at this, let's see what we can learn from this idea of the parable of the unjust steward. Someone has said that this is a good lesson from a bad example. Okay, So the idea that... Uh, Jesus doesn't condone what's being done here, what the man did, but he says there's a lesson we can learn from that, and we'll be looking at that uh, as we go along today. Uh, for those of you who are interested, I'm not wearing my watch. My watch died, or started dying, on March 15th, the last time we were in this building, uh, a few months ago. So it started dying then, and a, a week later, it completely died, and it's, it has one of those things on where it tells you the, the time, but it also gives you the day of the month and the month. It says March 23rd on it. And I haven't been in a store since then, so I haven't bought a watch battery yet. So I'll get one one of these days and start wearing my watch. So if I go over time today, blame it on my watch because I don't have it. I guess you could call that stewardship of time, and I'm not very well at it, not doing very well today. So the parable of the unjust steward. Let's see what's involved here. First of all, we see the crisis. And the crisis involved here in verses 1 and 2, he said, he said also to his disciples, now remember the Pharisees are listening to this, there was a certain rich man who had a steward or a manager, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. He fired him. He was done. He was out on the street. His work for him was done. He said, bring in the books. I want to see the books. Bring them to me and uh, let's see what's going on here. So that, that's the crisis involved here. And this um, 
steward or this manager was accused. Now somebody saw what he was doing. Some, the, man, the owner didn't see it. The rich man didn't see it. But somebody else saw what was going on and reported it to the rich man. Hey, this guy's wasting your goods. This guy is, he's not just pilfering off the top. He is completely wasting what's yours. In fact, the term waste here, if you look in verse, um, verse 1, he says, an accusation was brought to him that the man was wasting his goods. That word wasting there is the same word back in chapter 15 when it talks about the prodigal son. In verse 13, he says, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with riotous or prodigal living. Same word in the original language. So he was just completely wasting what didn't belong to him. And he was called to account for it. So that, that's the crisis he finds himself in. And uh, the manager says, bring me the books. I want, to see, I want to see what's going on here. Well, that's the crisis that's going on here. So then there's the concern. If you look in verse 3, the concern there, then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. Now, whether he was too weak or too old or too lazy, I think some translations say he was too weak, but he says, I can't dig, which basically means uh, farming. He said, I can't go out and farm like everybody else, or, or I don't want to or something. And I'm too ashamed to beg, but it's interesting. He was too ashamed to beg, but he wasn't too ashamed to lie and cheat and steal and be dishonest and commit fraud. But here, this man was, he was in, he was in a quandary. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm stuck here. I, I don't know what's going to happen. So we find that he is uh, wondering what's going to happen next. Uh, he goes, basically, oh no, now what? I've been caught, and I don't know what to do. So there was a concern on him, but then he came up with uh, a plan. His craftiness. In verses 4 through 7, he says, I have resolved what to do, that when I'm put out of the stewardship, when I'm, I'm actually fired, that they may receive me into their houses. He says, I've got a plan to, that I'm going to be taken care of uh, when all this is said and done. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him. I'll just stop right there and say, we don't know how many debtors he had, but we have a record of two here. Uh, just two, but there may have been many more. We don't know. And it seems like they came one by one. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he says, a hundred measures of oil, somewhere between 800 and 900 gallons of olive oil taken from probably somewhere around 150 olive trees. That's quite a debt this man owes. So he said to him, quick, said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Cut it completely in half, 50%. And it was quite a bill that he owed. He said, just cut it in 50%. And then he calls in another. He said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. So here he is, again, cutting, he's cutting this one by 20%, cutting it down to um, 80 measures of wheat. And the measures of wheat there would be, he owed him somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 bushels of wheat, about 100 acres worth of crops that he owed this, this rich man. And this guy, this steward who didn't own anything, took it upon himself to cut the bill in half. Now, now how would you feel if you were going to buy a new pickup truck and you made a deal with the salesperson for $30,000. Can you buy a truck for $30,000 anymore? Probably not. But, but he's buying a truck for $30,000, and uh, you get home, and the salesman calls you up and says, hey, I'm between a rock and a hard place here, and, and I might need a favor down the road. Cut that in half to $15,000, and, and, and we'll just let it go at that. You think, what in the world's going on here? Well, first of all, his manager wouldn't allow that. His own, the owner of the dealership wouldn't allow that. But if you could just imagine something like that happening, how would you feel toward that salesman? Would you say, let's go to Russell's for a steak tonight? I want to pay you back a little bit. Or would you say, I, I owe you here. Can, is there anything I can do for you? You just saved me $15,000. 
Well, that's the situation that this, this steward here is trying to, trying to gain some favors down the road, wants some payback. He wants people to say, I'm going to do you a big favor, and I want you to do me a big favor. And you might be asking, what in the world does that have to do with Christianity? We'll get to that in a minute. But the idea here, he, he's got this plan, this craftiness involved here. He's, he's got it figured out that I'm going to... Uh, do this for them, and then when I get fired, they're going to take care of me. I'm saving them a ton of money, and when I get done, when, this, when I'm actually out of turn in the books and I'm fired, they're going to take care of me. These people who, who I've done a great favor for, uh, even though I was dishonest and fraudulent and lying about it, they're, they're going to take care of me. From the worldly standpoint, that sounds pretty smart. But from the Christian standpoint, it's not smart at all. But notice them. After this craftiness thing, we see the commendation. His master, the rich man, notice what he says in verse 8. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. He commended him. He, from the worldly standpoint, he was basically saying, Wow, I'll give it to you. You put one over on me that time. Uh, I'd have never thought of that. How, how'd you come up with that by yourself? You, you really did a good one there. And, and that's what the, ma the master probably had a whole lot more money that he wasn't concerned about. But he was saying to this, this steward, the guy he just fired, he says, that, that was pretty smart. That was pretty shrewd. That was pretty intelligent. Uh, how'd you come up with something like that? And he commended him. The question is, did Jesus commend him? No. Jesus did not commend him. In fact, we see Jesus turning that around and making a spiritual application. And we call it a, a kind of a, a comparison from the lesser to the greater. And we'll see how that works. So this man wasn't commended. In the, in the latter part of verse 8, we see Jesus' observation of that. Jesus says, starting at the middle of verse 8, for the sons of this world, that's the, the worldly people who have no interest in eternity or spiritual things, are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. The sons of light would be referring to Christians, referring to God's people. So he said they're more shrewd. And what he's saying there is sometimes people of the world have a greater interest in taking care of the future, even though theirs is a physical future, than what we as Christians do in making plans for our spiritual future. What else can we learn about this? What else can we say? Notice then we see the caution. The caution. Jesus comments on this now and makes some applications. Starting in verse 9. Jesus says, and I say to you, let's just stop right there for a second. Jesus says, and I say to you, you don't see it in the English translations, but it's in the original language. Jesus is emphasizing I. He says, and I say to you, here's, and he's comparing what he said to what the rich man said. The rich man said this to his disciples. Wow, that was pretty good. But I say to you, Let's look at the other side of that. Let's see what we can learn from that. So Jesus is saying, And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that, you, that when you fail, or when they fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you now what is your own? So Jesus is saying to his disciples as he is instructing them and knowing that the Pharisees are there in the background listening to every word he's saying, looking for another way to, to trap him, knowing that he is criticizing them. Uh, he is basically saying this you know, comparing the, the lesser to the greater, how much more should Christians be looking out for their future, even with their, their physical blessings, even with the things that we've been blessed with here on this earth, 
How much more should the Christian be looking out for their future than the worldly person looking out for his physical future as he uses fraud and lies and so on? Jesus is not commending the steward for doing what he did. Jesus is saying we as Christians need to be wise and we need to be wiser than the world. And as we try to um, prepare for eternity, imagine if you will, and, and Jesus kind of brings this out here. If you look at the end of verse 9, and I say, or in verse 9 he says, And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by, by money. Okay, by the, the physical money. Unrighteous money is what he calls it. Uh, the money that fails is what it amounts to. When, when that fails, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Imagine... When you step through those gates of heaven, I don't know exactly what that's going to be like. I don't know, you know all the ins and outs of, of what that's going to be like. But imagine as you step through the gates of heaven and just on the other side of those gates are some people that you helped while you lived here on the earth. Are some people that you blessed with your money, with your gifts, with your benevolence, with your help. Imagine how you, how you will be welcomed by them. This unjust steward used his money to gain favors. We use our money to bless people, to help people, to bless the church. We use our money in a way that will have eternal benefits. We lay up treasures, not here, but in heaven. Whether little or much, we can use it for God's glory. Notice these words in Matthew chapter 25. When Jesus told the parable of the, the talents, he says in verse 21, His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Well, he took care of the things he had here on this earth, and he used them to bless God. In verse 29, For everyone who has, more will be given. He will have an abundance. And from him who does not have, even that will be taken away. I recall... When I was just a little fellow, uh, there were seven of us kids at home, lived out in the country, didn't have a whole lot, and the dryer, you know, we had a clothes dryer, and it died. And uh, you know, it was in the wintertime, uh, typically you know, go out and hang them on the clothesline. West Virginia, uh, wintertime's not all the most pleasant place in the world to live. And I remember coming home from school one day, just a young fellow, and there was a new dryer sitting there in, um, in the laundry room. I don't know that we ever did find out who did that. And I'm looking forward to being in heaven and, and seeing who comes through that gate and we find out who did that. But someone bought my mom and dad a new clothes dryer when there was a need. They went out of their way and, and they, they blessed our family. Well, that, that's what he's talking about here. Using what we have to help somebody else, to be a blessing to somebody, to see a need and, and reaching out and helping them. And that has eternal benefits. That's just not from the worldly standpoint, but it has eternal benefits tied to it as well. And then we come to what Jesus gives us as a choice. In verse 13, he says, no man can, or no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one or love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So you have to make a choice. Who are you going to serve? Are you going to expect your, your money to be your master and God to be your servant? Or are you expecting God to be your master and your money to be your servant? So you have to make a choice there as to who you're going to put on the throne of your heart. And if we put our material things, our money, our properties, our things, if we put those on the throne of our heart, then we are going to be very disappointed when eternity is ushered in. But if we put God on the throne of our heart, if we put Him there, then that's where we will find the great joy, entering into the joy of our Lord. So we have this choice. Jesus put it this way, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. We'll look at that verse uh, again as we close today. And then in, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 
Paul talks about rich Christians. Yes, there were rich Christians, and yes, there was nothing wrong with rich Christians. In fact, wealthy Christians are a tremendous blessing to the church. But notice the instructions he gives them. He says in verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. But then he gives instructions to those folks who are rich in verses 17 through 19. First Timothy chapter 6, 17 to 19. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come. There's that eternal benefit in that. That they may lay hold on eternal life. We must possess our possessions instead of allowing our possessions to possess us. We need to allow those things to be our servant. And then there is the condemnation, verses 14 to 18. Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also when they heard these things, they derided him. The word deride there, they turned their noses up at him. You ever see someone just turn their nose up from somebody and just walk away? That's what the Pharisees were doing to Jesus, turning their nose up to him. So this condemnation here in verse uh, 14, they derided him. And then what Jesus says in verse 15 and following, he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is rightly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone's pressing into it. It's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. Whoever marries her is divorced from her husband commits adultery. You might be saying, how'd that verse get in there? Well, what Jesus is saying to the, the Pharisees, you have been stewards of the law of Moses up until this point. Now, it's about to be done away with and nothing's going to be done away until the time. But he says, you haven't been very good stewards of the law. You have changed it to suit yourselves. You have changed it to gain favors from other people. You have changed the laws. And he uses one example here. You've even changed the laws that were put into place on divorce and remarriage. He says, you just make it to suit yourselves. The one indication given in the New Testament is for if one of those commits fornication or adultery, then that frees up the innocent person to remarry. And that's, that's the bottom line. But the Pharisees had changed that to suit themselves, had changed that to suit their friends so that they could gain favors from them because they love money and they wanted the favors from other people. So we see the condemnation here. But what does that all boil down to for us? Our heavenly well-being depends on how we handle the possessions that are entrusted to us here on this earth. The things that God has blessed, everything that we have, God has blessed us with, how are we using that? And we are all stewards of what we have. Are we faithful stewards? Now, very quickly, uh, here are some areas where we need to be careful as far as our stewardship. First of all, our time. What do you do with your time? Do you kill time, waste time, use time, uh, manage time? What do we do with our time? We need to realize in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We need to be good stewards of our time. We need to be good stewards of our money. Not to be wasteful and just using it on things that are just completely wasteful, but we need to be using our money in a way that's right and good, where it's a blessing to others. We need to be good stewards of our talent. Um, the talents that we have, uh, are we using those for God's glory? Uh, if you have a talent that can be rightfully used in the service of God, then so be it. If you have a talent that's useful in serving, in serving others, then, then that's great. Use it that way. But use your talents and develop your talents to be a blessing to others. Your families. Uh, we're stewards of our families. We're stewards. Husbands, uh, you are stewards over your, your wife and your, your children. You're stewards. You, you have a responsibility there because God has given you those things, and now you have a responsibility to, to care for them. And we have a family here, this, this family of God. And we're, we, we all have a stewardship here of caring for one another, looking out for one another. Pray for our elders. They, uh, they have been faced with 
decisions that have never been considered for people, as far as I know, in the church. Over the past three months, they've had to, to wrestle with and make decisions that people have never had to wrestle with. So pray for them and pray for their wisdom and, and express to them your appreciation and your love. So you, we're stewards of our families. We're also stewards of our own bodies. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we need to take care of ourselves the best we can, not to abuse our bodies by bad habits and things like that. And then we are stewards of the gospel. Uh, Paul talked about being a steward of the gospel. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Verses 16 and 17, for if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For this I do willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I have been entrusted with a stewardship. A stewardship of the gospel to protect it, to, to, not, to not abuse it, to not uh, change it in any way, and then to share it. So we are stewards. And we mentioned earlier, these verses, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, but lay it where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So we ask today the question, where's your heart? Where's your heart? Do you have a heart that is uh, a good steward, taking care of the things that God has blessed you with? Everything that we own, we think we own. God owns ultimately, and we need to be good stewards of that. Have you ever known someone who was just tremendously blessed in so many ways and never took advantage of those blessings? Have you ever known someone who was so, so rich and yet didn't know what to do with those riches when he had them? I know when... Younger preachers are up here preaching. They use examples from uh, Star Wars and, and movies like that. Well, I'm going to revert to the Beverly Hillbillies, okay? <laughs> Let's go back a generation or two. And the Beverly Hillbillies, they, they became extremely rich physically and didn't know what to do with it. They were stuck in their old ways. We have become extremely rich spiritually. Through Christ, the riches of His grace, the riches of His salvation, the riches of the hope that we have of heaven. We are extremely rich. Are we using those riches? Are, are we taking advantage of what God has blessed us with? This morning, it may be the fact that you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ. And we would encourage you that today might be that perfect day to do that. To become one who is a Christian, a child of God. To be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you've done that, but perhaps you realize that you haven't been a very good steward of what God has blessed you with. Perhaps you haven't been a very good steward of, of managing your family or managing your time or managing your money. Or maybe you just haven't been a very good steward of, of your own spiritual life. Maybe you haven't managed temptation very well. Well, we encourage you today, if you need the prayers of the church, you need to make something right, now would be the perfect time. We encourage you today to be a good steward, and we encourage you, if you need to, to come today as we stand and sing together. I cannot today what the morrow may bring, it's shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know will live for everything, and all of my worry is
Thanks for joining us for worship services this morning. Um, with so much going on uh, around us in our world today, um, it's easy to become distracted. I know uh, that's something that I tend to struggle with. Um, I'm reminded of 2 Timothy chapter 1 where Paul tells Timothy, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but power, love, and self-control. We pray that you'll have a wonderful and safe week this week and look forward to um, you joining us again. Uh, next week for our online worship. Thanks.